Hi there, welcome back to MTN Outdoors. I'm Tom Buchanan and I'll be your guide for this week's episode. We have a great show for you today. From dramatic footage of a sheriff deputy escaping a wildfire to a visit to Prairie Dog Town. But first, we head to Butte, where all the talk in the mining city was about a black bear and two cubs. Wildlife officials may finally have the two black bear cubs that have been wandering through Butte the past two days fenced in this tree in the middle of the Montana Tech campus. Unfortunately, they had to fatally shoot the mother of the cubs. It was a decision that many people found very upsetting. It just, it just really sucks, you know? I mean, I didn't hear that she had been actually bothering anybody, so I kind of feel like maybe they should have waited a little bit before they, before they killed her. You know, yeah. she has the babies, and you know, it just would have been nice if she'd been able to live. A black bear and her two cubs were first reported foraging through trash on Butte's west side just after midnight, August 27th. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks officials eventually shot the sow about 2.40 in the morning the following day on the campus of Montana Tech. Police report the bear was first shot twice with a tranquilizer, but it had no effect. I mean, it's sad that mama's gone, but hopefully they can get the babies protected. The cubs were eventually found up a tree in the middle of the campus. FWP officials, with the help of campus security, erected a fence around the tree to prevent the cubs from leaving the area. Baited traps were also set up inside the fenced area to try to capture the cubs. All this occurred during the first week of the fall semester. So the little cubs caught a lot of attention from many on the campus. I was sitting in class and I was like, there's a, there's a bear guys. And all my friends were looking at me and they're like, it's a mama with cubs too. And I was like, oh man, this could either be really good or really bad. In Butte, John Amy. MTN News. We do have an update on those two cubs. Both cubs were captured and transported to the Montana Wildlife Center in Helena. Staff are caring for the bears while making sure they're not getting used to humans. If everything works out, they'll be released back into the wild sometime this fall. I was nervous. Yeah, absolutely I was nervous. Few of us can imagine willingly driving into a scene like this. And Rosebud County Patrol Sergeant Joshua Jonas never thought he'd be surrounded by a wall of flames either when set out on Cow Creek Road last Friday. We're in almost 200,000 acres and it's a big recreational area. So we try and get out and make sure people are aware of fires coming. Jonas was headed to a popular campsite to make sure no one was still in the fire's path. That's kind of what led me going down that road um, is just because I knew there were some tents on that road prior. But that fairly routine trek quickly turned into a heated situation, forcing Jonas to act fast. When I felt the big gust of wind come through um, and I saw the blazes come up and I just knew that was a bad spot to be in. And I had one, one thought on my mind at that point, that was to get out of there. Jonas was able to escape, but knows how lucky he was. Some people overcredit my bravery. Sometimes it's just me doing my job. I wasn't thinking anything of that. And five days later, this area now looks much different. One of these trees was still on fire and just, I heard a crack and it just came crashing down. Uh, and that's what you worry about. Like the windstorm comes through, it's gonna knock a bunch of these down. Rosebud County Sheriff Alan Fulton took us into the burn zone to see what remains. While the flames are long gone, the devastation is obvious but Fulton also sees what many may not. This is how a lot of the houses are in the path of this thing as a fire line and they saved them, you know, and it's burned right up to the house. And both he and Sergeant Jonas hope images like these will leave a lasting impression of just how quickly a safe situation can take a dangerous turn. We thought it'd be good to post that video just to show individuals that, yeah, it might look relatively safe going in, especially with people that don't know what they're looking at or seeing, doesn't mean it can't change in a hurry. And so I guess our best piece of advice is if it's on fire, stay away. In Bernie, Isabel Sparts, MTN News. I'm Brianna Juno with MTN News, playing hide and seek. It's all part of a local canine search and rescue team's way of training their canine animals. Show me. 
Canine hide and seek training is essential for sharpening the skills of the canine units, enabling them to better locate missing persons in real life situations. Where is she? Yeah. Training is really important because we want the dogs to stay at um, their their ultimate or best um, skill set, and uh, we need volunteers to come help and do um, to hide for us because we want the dogs not to be uh, thinking in their mind that they only look for one or two people. That the dogs need to know that they're out looking for anybody in the area. What? Show me. Where is it? The Cascade SAR K-9 Search and Rescue Team, as well as the Black Eagle Search and Rescue Team dogs are trained in both alive and cadaver body detections. Having a available search dog can greatly speed up the efficiency of a search and sometimes can be the only uh, deciding factor of somebody is found or recovered. During these hide and seek sessions, volunteers act as missing persons, hiding in various locations while the dogs use their noses to track them down. They're well behaved when they're out searching and doing their, their job and um, that's part of the training as well. Um, and that's, they, they really focus in and enjoy looking for um, people that are lost. By volunteering, participants will not only help train the dogs, but will gain firsthand experience in the incredible capabilities of search and rescue canines, who play a critical role in saving lives. So we're extremely proud when we're able to, to, to provide that service to the community and to uh, bring somebody back home. Uh, that's, that's an incredible moment for us. Oh, right there. Good boy. All right. Good job, buddy. Local residents interested in volunteering can learn more on our website. In Great Falls, Brianna Juno, MTN News. According to a report done by Yellowstone National Park, tourism has contributed $828 million to nearby communities. And today I'm in Gardner, one of these gateway communities, to see how this tourism is really affecting local businesses. So this is going to be our second season. We originally started as a Hawaiian Shave Ice Trailer in 2022 and then upgraded to the deli shop and we've been running the deli ever since. Nick Sabo owns and operates Paradise Deli in Gardner with his wife Celeste. They started their business during a precarious year in Gardner, 2022's Yellowstone River flooding. According to the data by Yellowstone National Park, the park's economic output suffered across the state in 2022. Despite the intense spike that occurred after the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021. This town turned into a ghost town, you know, in the summertime, which never happens. And, um, you know, this town as a whole actually was still feeling the impact of the flood from even last year. Gardner is a unique gateway town. It's unincorporated from Park County and completely surrounded by national park and forest land. Its economy almost entirely reliant on tourism. Sabo says this has created equally as unique challenges for those living and working in Gardner. The housing situation in town has definitely made things hard as a business and even, you know, people here just wanting to live um, without owning a business, it's almost near impossible. One example of this challenge is student enrollment in Gardner. Officials say the school has struggled with enrollment rates due to the lack of affordable housing to keep long-term residents around. But Sabo says he's determined to stay in the place he grew up. This town means a lot to me, you know. I was raised here. Um, I have a lot of memories here. I don't plan on going anywhere else. And so, you know, we had the opportunity to open something and we decided to and to contribute to the town as best as we could. But even after pandemics, fires and floods? You know, this is a small town, um, tight knit community. Um, I feel like for the most part, everyone's got each other's backs. And when people are in need, um, Gardner definitely rises to the occasion. To view the 2023 Yellowstone Tourism Report, visit our website. In Gardner, Heaven Van, MTN News. If you're driving too fast down Interstate 90 past Big Timber, you might miss an entire state park devoted to nature's engineers. Prairie Dog Town State Park is filled with hundreds of these holes digging by that interesting creature that you can even see up close. Oh, they're cute. They're, they're fun to watch. They're pretty, they got character. 
many stumble upon Prairie Dog Town State Park completely by accident. Jim and Carol Tallman were on a road trip across America from their home state of Alaska when a road sign caught their attention. It's been great. It's been a little windy today, but uh, it's been fun. There's lots of prairie dogs to look at and it's a beautiful area. And just as the name suggests, as far as the eye can see are hundreds of those furry little creatures. Prairie Dog Town opened its doors in 1974 and has been offering free access to Montana residents since. The property was acquired specifically for prairie dog habitat and preserving black-tailed prairie dogs. Ryder Pagan is the regional recreation manager of the state parks in the area, working to keep local wildlife safe. Yeah, it's, it's strictly for wildlife enjoyment. It's a good way to get outside, take take a lunch break or end or spend the day out here. And those prairie dogs aren't the only animals here, as the park offers a habitat to owls, badgers and snakes. Sunny day to get some good pictures and just see the cute little see the cute little critters. But while Jim and Carol Tomlin love prairie dogs, many farmers and homeowners don't as they build holes and colonies that can be dangerous to larger animals. So they do a lot of mounding and when they build their colonies they can create holes which can cause, you know, uh, concerns with, with cattle management, uh, specifically, you know, cattle can break their legs. And because of that, Prairie Dog Town works as a safe space for the animals and for people to enjoy as well. It's just fun to get outside and take a look at something that, you, you know, we don't have prairie dogs in Alaska, so this is kind of an opportunity to, to see something unique. In Big Timber, Matt Carmack, MTU News. Coming up after the break, we head to Reed Point for the Great Montana Sheep Drive. But first, it's time for some trivia. Speaking of sheep, do you know how heavy bighorn sheep horns can get? That answer coming up after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. So, do you know how heavy bighorn sheep horns can get? Older rams have horns that can measure over three feet and weigh up to 30 pounds, as much as the rest of the bones in a bighorn sheep combined. Now, a lot of people will tell you cattle is king in Montana for livestock, but the folks of Reed Point are not sheepish about their favorite livestock, as MTN's Marcus Kakova reports. There are 600 sheep coming! Don't be a hero! Hold on to your children! These are unpredictable beasts! It's not uh, for the faint of heart. The last year, uh, the sheep ran through booths. The year before, they broke down the fence at the post office. And that's why the theme this year was, oh, sheep. It seems like the sheep are allowed to kind of terrorize the town a little bit. Yeah, one day a year. Contributing one and a half million pounds of wool, generating more than three million dollars in our state, sheep do a lot for Montana. Cattle are big but sheep are big too, and it's part of our economy, and it's pretty unique to this area. It's partly why Reed Point continues the tradition that began as a cattle drive spoof nearly 40 years ago. It's why every sheep gets their day. This is basically our Christmas. These are called lambscapes, L-A-M-B. S-C-A-P-E-S. -E so a little bit of big sky country Montana is in many, many countries around the world to remind us that we are all woven together. <laughs> While sheep are at the center of their own small economy, the people of Reed Point say their presence helps draw in dollars to keep the community afloat, contributing to things like renovations and parks. The community makes a lot of money here. And we thought of having the people show up once a year. I just feel like it's just our ability to put on a good event and show that Reed Point, you know, isn't uh, lost. And those contributions are important, not just for those who have loved Reed Point, but for those who will continue to cherish it for a lifetime. Both our parents grew up here. Yeah. Like some, not all of them, but some. Yeah. And like, it's just like one big kind of like family because it's so small. Everybody knows everybody. Marcus Kukova, MTN News. One Helena small business is making sure their products are just as healthy for the environment as they are for the consumer. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, it is an idea called regenerative agriculture, meant to restore soil and ecosystem health, address inequity, and leave our land, waters, and climate in better shape for future generations. 
After returning home to Helena in 2020, John and Molly Moore started adding animals to their property. But within the last year, they fully committed to launching their small business, Hoof and Paw Farm, which sells just about every goat and sheep product you would expect. From milk and cheese to wool and soap, all of the products are made with a focus in regenerative agriculture. Everything that comes out of a sheep can go back to the natural environment without doing any damage. You're trying to use what nature has and not add things to it that are going to interfere with it coming back. The married couple runs the business on their own, only getting outside help with shearing. The sheared fleece is then used for multiple products. It is sold raw, used for mulch and dryer balls, or Molly will spin it into yarn. The products are sold on Etsy, social media, and their website. That's the Mallard Dress Fishing Access Site, one of the more popular access sites on the Yellowstone River. Its biggest problem all along has been its access road. It's primarily river cobble. Great for forming a meandering stream like the Yellowstone, not great for building a road. The road had been a challenge for years. Then came the historic flooding of 2022. Effectively, the base of the road was gone. Gone but not forgotten. FWP had been working with the Department of Natural Resource and Conservation that owns adjacent land to change the access road. That effort stepped up after the flood and wrapped up this spring. That took some time, but we were able to get, get there, and, uh, and we're very pleased that uh, you know, we were able to be begin construction this summer. Construction took uh, a matter of you know, two to three weeks is all, uh, and we now have a new uh, entrance to uh, to one of the most popular fishing access sites in the Yellowstone River, so we're very happy to see it open and, and, uh, and being used once again. The old access road not only was sloughing off into the river, it also involved a blind hairpin curve and a steep drop to get in and get out. Not the easiest or safest approach for people with boat trailers or RVs. That, that has been removed. That's no longer part of the entrance. The, the entrance is now uh, a few hundred feet north of that original entrance. and. It has a very direct access, a much gentler grade going down into the site, to this site that really offers such a variety of recreation, right? You have river access, you have camping, you have uh, day use and other activities. Uh, this float between Mallard's Rest and Gray Owl fishing access site is, they, uh, folks call it the bird float, and it's one of the most popular floats on the Yellowstone River. So uh, that's once again an option for, for folks. And Jacobson says there's still work to do on the road cuts, but that should not affect access. Mallard's Rest Fishing Access site closed because of the flooding of the Yellowstone River back in 2022, and now more accessible and safer to drive into also because of those floods. In the Paradise Valley, Chet Lehman, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we see how honey production is doing and take a trip to Bumblewood Thicket. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back to quote one of our greatest minds of our time, Winnie the Pooh. Honey, it's pretty big business here under the big sky, but honey production is down for many hives as MTN's Charlie Kleps reports. It's a sound that strikes fear into some. The buzzing of honeybees. They're very important, they're pollinators. But get past the stingers, then what seemed like a frightening sight, and you'll be reminded just how important apiaries like these are for our ecosystem. So the pollination part is huge for all of us. Every third bite of food you take, Thank a honeybee. Their pollination affects nearly everything we eat and also plays a sweet role in the state's economy. Montana typically ranks in the top five states as far as the amount of honey we produce. All the way across here, that's all honey. But this year wasn't as sweet as years past. And to find out more about why, you have to really go behind the scenes. This year's buzz has been a bit muted. We had a really good year last year. This year wasn't the case. Columbus-based Sunshine Apiary has been around for decades. Vice President Patty Sunberg says production depends on moisture. This year's been a little bit tougher, especially uh, South Central, Montana, all the way to the West. If there's not flowers, bees can't make honey. Drought years are tough. 
uh, the, there's less nectar and the bees always do better on natural resources. That lack of production, a big hit to their income, but Sumberg says the real impact could be on our environment. But as far as the honeybees go, it's for them, it's their nutrition. We can stimulate them with syrups and artificial pollen patties, but it's not the same as them going to the plant and getting it from the flower. She says the loss of honeybees would leave a huge hole in Montana's landscape. So if you enjoy any diversity in trees and blooming plants and wildflowers and any of that, then you're gonna enjoy honeybees. You just don't know that's part of what you're enjoying. A dilemma affecting many apiaries around the state who are all hoping for rain next spring. You gotta take the good with the bad. So you just roll with it. Uh, we're going to give them what they need. We're going to give them some feed to get them through winter um, and get them prepped up for almond season next spring. In Carbon County, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. Magic is in the air because the fairies of Bumblewood Thicket are back in town here to show off their whimsical village. What inspired the candy store? I have two little boys who love candy, maybe more than me, unclear, <laughs> but it just felt right to have small little magic things also want to have candy. Mary is an architect who created one of the 20 structures displayed in this year's Fairy Village. Each structure has its own unique story, just like Mary's candy shop, which is conveniently placed right next to the Tooth Fairy Academy. Pinky is another artist. She included cultural aspects from the Philippines in her Uruke summer home. It came from the Philippines. Uh, it's from a palm tree. It's a tribal house, and they do have houses like this. Random acts of silliness in partnership with Gallatin Valley Land Trust and the city of Bozeman has helped bring Bumblewood Thicket to life for the last five years. The fairies are always around. You just might not know it. And once a year, they really invite the community into their space. And the community is ready for the fairies, considering last Last year, around 18,000 visitors felt the magic of Bumblewood Thicket. And this year, they're expecting even more. We know that just building trails isn't enough. You really have to make sure to pull people in. And an installation like this and this, this magical experience is an invitation to families to, to maybe go a little bit outside their comfort zone. This magical fairy community is hidden away in the forest behind Glen Lake Rotary Park. And these trails are friendly to all ages. I think everybody has a little bit of a connection to the fairies. Whether you're a kid or an adult, I think we all want to believe in something, right? And, and magic is just something that connects us all. If you want to come experience the magic, as well as support artists who've spent months creating these intricate structures. I started working on this probably middle of June. So, you know, it feels really good to see it be a final product. Bumblewood Thicket is open to the public Friday, August 30th until September 22nd. For more information on this fairy village, visit our website in Bozeman, Cassidy Powers, MTN News. Well, that's gonna about wrap things up for this week's episode of MTN Outdoors. We hope you enjoyed yourself on this trek across the state. Until next time, get out there, have fun, and stay safe. Bye for now.